So I'm going to try to do a very brief uh, explanation of Bitcoin for assuming that you guys know nothing about Bitcoin. So if you do know something about Bitcoin, forgive me. Uh, I'm going to explain some things that you already know. I find that when you talk about Bitcoin, um, it's a little bit like this saying that says that when the genius points at the moon, the fool looks at the finger. We, I find that we gravitate too quickly to some um, details of Bitcoin where it's the the cryptography or how is it mined or who created it. And in looking at those details, we big, miss the bigger picture. And the bigger picture, in my opinion, is that Bitcoin could well be the best form of money we've ever seen. And, and if that is true, it could do for information. Um, it could do for money what the internet did to information. This, the best way to understand why it could be the best form of money we have ever seen is to understand money itself. And the best explanation of money it's not the one that we are told in schools, and for most of us, it's not actually what we intuitively think money is. Money is actually something very different than what we intuitively think it is. The best proper explanation that we have about money comes from anthropologists, and what they explain to us is that from about 100,000 years ago to about 25,000 years ago, the way we ex did exchanges, we did commerce, um, had nothing to do with barter. And that, this is very counterintuitive to most of us because we were taught that we did barter, and that was very complicated, and that's why we invented money. And the anthropologists say there's no proof that that ever happened. No civilization, no tribe ever based its commerce on barter. The way commerce happened um, before there was money was that uh, if you had killed a big buffalo, someone would come to you and say, hey, that big buffalo is too much for you alone. It's going to go bad. Can you give me a little bit of meat? And you would decide where you want to give that person a little bit of meat or not. And if you did give that person a little bit of meat, you had to keep a record in your brain that that person owed you something. And if a lot of people came and you gave this to a lot of people, you have to remember how much each person owed you. And it's a very subjective system because it's nowhere written how much each one of them owes you and when they need to pay. But it worked for longer than any other system we've used. It worked for 25,000 years. Until about 25,000 years ago, someone very intelligent came up in a tribe with, with a new technology that was very successful and it took off, which is you killed another buffalo and this very intelligent person came to you and said, can I have a little bit of meat? And you said, sure, here's the meat. And this person said, here are some seashells for you. And you said, no, I don't need seashells. And he said, it's not about whether you need seashells or not. Instead of happy, keeping these subjective ledgers in our brain about who owes us what, we are going to use seashells as the objective ledger for our tribe. In our tribe, no one else has to remember anything about what you are owed. You just show the seashells and it means that you're, you're owed something. And it was such a successful technology that it took off. In a few thousand years, you cannot find a tribe or a civilization that does not have some form of objective ledger. In some cases, it was seashells. In other cases, it was beads. In other cases, it was salt. In other cases, it was hides, but all tribes and civilizations developed some form of objective ledger that we ended up calling money, but it was just another form of an objective ledger. And about 5,000 years ago, and, 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 and the anthropologists go as far as saying, if you describe to an anthropologist the, the environment of a tribe, they can predict what's going to emerge as objective ledger in that tribe, because it's always something that has these six characteristics. The most important characteristic has to be scarce. For obvious reasons, if we use a ledger that I can easily fake, uh, it will not be a good ledger. But it also helps if it's divisible, portable, durable, recognizable, and fungible. Um, the scarcity has to do with the store of value function of money, and the more scarce something is, it, it, it better serves as a store of value. And the others have to do mostly with the payment me mechanism function of money. About 5,000 years ago, Tribes begin to trade a lot with other tribes, and commerce began to extend geographically. And this system broke down because some tribes were using hides, and other ones were using salt, and other ones were using beads. And then they settled on something that was universally scarce. Slowly, we settled on gold. And gold has been an uni a universal form of money for 5,000 years. And it has had a capacity to store value m much better than any other currency we have ever seen. Um, this is hard to understand from where we are sitting today because the global store of value is the, U the US dollar. And before that, it, it was the, the British pound. And before that, it was the Dutch. And before that, the French and the, the, the Portuguese and um, the Spanish and the Portuguese. 
but, but for 5,000 years, gold was sort of the global currency. And only for the last 500 years, we have this new phenomenon of, of global currencies that sit on top of gold, and they are exchangeable for gold at times, and at times they are not. Right now, the dollar is not exchangeable for gold. Um, but the closest we've ever had to a global currency has been gold. And um, the three myths that I try to illustrate about money that I try to illustrate with this short story is that number, the most important one is that it's a myth that money comes from barter. Money actually reflects a, a, a need to keep track of credit and to make credit transferable. The second big myth, and probably the biggest one, is that money has some intrinsic value. Some people think that those seashells, that the, some of those tribes thought that those seashells had intrinsic value, and we all understand that they were wrong. But some people think that gold has intrinsic value, and they have the same intrinsic value that seashells do. You, you cannot eat gold, you cannot shelter yourself with gold. It's only valuable because we're using it as mon for money, as money. We use it for jewelry because it's valuable, not the other way around. It has absolutely no intrinsic value. And this is a big myth. If you don't understand that myth, it's sort of hard to understand money. It's just a ledger. And the last myth is that money is created by governments and it exists because it's sponsored by government. And the truth is money has been around for a lot longer than governments have been around and reflects a very basic social need. And as long as there are social interactions, you will always have the emergence of one way, form of another of, of money. When you compare the six qualities that make gold such a great uh, form of money and you compare it to Bitcoin, you can see why Bitcoin could potentially be the best form of money we have ever seen. Bitcoin is, there will never be more than 21 million Bitcoins, so it's perfectly scarce. In the case of gold, we do not know how much gold exactly there is or how much more will be mined. In terms of divisibility, gold is fairly easy to divide, but Bitcoin is digital, it's trivially easy to divide. It Bitcoin is, each Bitcoin is composed of 100 million pieces called Satoshis. Um, go, and, and the rest, because gold is physical and Bitcoin is digital, you know, Bitcoin is much more portable, durable, and recognizable. The only one in which gold is probably better is that it's fungible. You truly don't care if you get one coin or another, whereas with Bitcoin, because each Bitcoin carries within itself its entire transaction history, you probably want one that has a very clean transaction history. Um, so the, the things that make Bitcoin special are, are only three things and very easy to understand. One is that nobody controls it. It's very easy to say, hey, let's design a system that nobody controls, but it's very hard to accomplish. And in the case of Bitcoin, it's brilliantly and very elegantly accomplished. The second one is that it's scarce. There will never be more than 21 million Bitcoin and nobody can change that. And the last one is that once you own some Bitcoin, you are free to transfer them to anyone in the world anywhere in the world in real time and for free. And this is the first time that this happens. Up until now, if I had some value and I wanted to transfer it to someone else, I needed the help of the Medici bankers in Italy or the Rothschilds in Europe or some other bank or settlement house or Visa, MasterCard, PayPal. Someone had to sit in the middle. And this is the first time that I can send money from here to anywhere in the world in real time and for free. And that's truly revolutionary. When you put all of those three conditions together, it's very likely the best form of money we have ever seen. Um, and again, for the two forms of money as a store of value, Bitcoin probably is a better store of, money, of value eventually than the best one we've seen so far than gold because it's more scarce. And as a form of payment, it's just more transferable and universally transferable. If you consider that today the most accepted form of payment must be US dollar bills in cash probably are more accepted than any other instrument in the world. It's easy to see how you could see a world in which Bitcoins are more accepted than any other form of money. Right now, it's very early in the Bitcoin history. It's like 1994, maybe, before the internet. And um, Bitcoin has already very early strong network effects. About a year ago, Bitcoin was 50% of all cryptocurrency transactions. And today is 50%. Uh, it's, today is 96%. Um, of all cryptocurrency transactions. It's being used um, and at, at, at this rate. In five years, it will have more users than PayPal. And at that point, it's more useful as a payment mechanism than it is today. Um, and it could become the global cryptocurrency of the internet. The internet does not have a currency. It desperately needs one. And Bitcoin is the best candidate we've seen so far. Most of the use that we see in the developed world here in the US and in Europe is using it as a very asymmetric bet. Most people are using Bitcoin thinking that 
if, if Bitcoin does not work, all they can lose is the little money they put into it and they put 1% or less of their savings into it. But if Bitcoin works, they think that a Bitcoin should be worth a million dollars or more sometime in the next 10 years. And I agree with that. I think that Bitcoin is incredibly risky. So I would not advise anyone to buy an amount of Bitcoin they cannot afford to lose because there's a non-trivial chance that Bitcoin goes to zero. Um, and I think that chance is at least 20%. But there is, a, in my opinion, higher than 50% that Bitcoin is worth more than a million dollars. So it's a very risky uh, but very asymmetrical bet. And when I see people who own Bitcoin in the US, in Europe, in other developed countries, this is what they're doing. They're not using it for payment. They're just speculating that it may be a good bet. And, and that with a very small investment of 1% a, of, a, uh, of their portfolio could turn into 40 times their entire portfolio. At Sapo, we are the largest custodians of Bitcoin in the world, and some of our largest customers are hedge funds and family offices that are doing this. They're not using it for payment or anything else. But the most interesting phenomenon that we see is that we think that it could, Bitcoin could do to money what the cell phone did to telecommunications. The highest number of landlines that we saw was 1.3 billion, and now there's more than, three point, uh, more than 6 billion cell phones. Most people around the world completely bypassed the landlines and went straight to mobile phones. And we think that um, this is very similar to what you see with banks around the world. There's about 1.3 billion people who have credit cards, Visa and MasterCard credit cards. And we can imagine a world in which more than 6 billion people are transacting directly on their cell phones with Bitcoin and completely bypass ever needing a bank account or a credit card. And we think that a world in which that happens is a much better world. And that's why we're trying to make it happen. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Wences. Uh, you will see that the next presentation is totally different from the one from Wences, and uh, we will talk about this difference in the, in the last part of the, of the presentations. Well, this is time for Tom Hartle. So a little bit about myself as I'm kind of plugging in here. Um, my background uh, comes out of a publishing background. I uh, owned a magazine called Spin Magazine, a music magazine, started a couple of magazines here in San Francisco, Cisco, and they got involved with Apple in 2008 when they were readying the iPad. Let's see, this has come up. Here we go. Um, to bring the iPad to market, um, I divested out of all the print stuff that I own, the rock and roll magazine, all that stuff, and then uh, started to build apps for them. But I was building them in, in music. And um, what was interesting is Apple, uh, with the iPad, wasn't planning on, well, the they had an interest in healthcare, but the healthcare market had been dominated by Microsoft technology uh, until these products came out. And what they realized was, was there, there was a great market for whether they were medical students or hospitals themselves um, to use these devices, the hardware, um, inside, uh, inside the hospitals or inside the schools. But they didn't have developers to develop uh, pieces of technology to accommodate um, to accommodate the needs of the buyers, the hospitals or the, the universities. So they tapped a number of uh, small companies. I was one of them. I was making a George Harrison and Bon Jovi app at the time when they called me in and said, we'd like you to switch from George Harrison and Bon Jovi uh, over to making uh, apps in healthcare. And what was interesting, you know, you talk about the design challenges that we heard in the last, um, in the last speech, uh, the speech before, um, healthcare in general is a business to business environment that has a very defined marketplace. And so we needed, Apple needed people actually out of entertainment, uh, not out of healthcare, not the incumbents who had thought and imagined the world in a much different way uh, and were reticent to change. So they tapped a bunch of companies out of entertainment to come in and solve some of the problems. So I'm gonna show you uh, what the app does real quick uh, and then we can, we can move on. Basically there are a couple of engines that drive it. Um, in healthcare, and we're all healthcare consumers, um, and if you have older parents, you certainly understand this too. Um, the failure to educate and engage patients in their health, the failure to describe what is happening with somebody's body creates enormous amounts of havoc and disruption in the workflows in the business matters of these hospitals. And so we studied, uh, we were with a hospital in the Midwest uh, out of Michigan for a year, just studying how they actually uh, workflowed out patient engagement 
uh, and patient education. And what we saw was there were all of these stressors and obstacles that came in that were involved so that when Tom Hartle was trying to uh, learn about something, uh, a condition he had or his father had, the nurse or the clinician would leave the room, try to or go to a computer, try to print something out. There might not be pr paper in the printer or printer doesn't work or whatever. So that clinician was actually making a uh, conscious decision not to educate us in any other meaningful way than just tell us. So we, uh, the first engine is an anatomy engine that basically allows the clinician, I'll just, and I'll just stay with uh, ortho, we have, t t I guess, 10 apps right now in the app store and more coming. So if we were looking at a knee, for example, um, the clinician at the point of care without leaving um, the side of the patient uh, could actually describe circle where the meniscus tear was and then actually text it or send it to the patient. All HIPAA certified, all secure, um, and I'll do it, well, I won't do it anybody's phone, but all of this stuff then, sp then spits out to the, uh, to the patient. What it does is a couple of things. It allows the clinician to not have to leave the room, and then it creates a digital fingerprint of that, which is very important for risk management, uh, and then um, all the payment stuff that these hospitals are facing. The second part of the engine, or the second engine in the app, um, really was that the clinician, clinicians wanted to have us explain more about, they needed more visuals, because we're all visual learners. Uh, I'll show you just one one thing that we make. So the clinicians asked us to make, uh, and this is an aortic valve replacement, uh, minimally invasive. Now remember, I'm in rock and roll about four, five years ago when we met, <laughs> making Bon Jovi apps, and now I'm making these things. But it was only because the imagination of the clinicians was so captivating, uh, and we were able to apply some basic technology. The clinician talks over top of this as uh, uh, in the actual video, I just have the sound turned off. So he's describing this whole procedure, and at the same time, he's in front of the client or in front of the patient, and then easily sends it to the patient. Um, there's about a, five other uh, important um, feature sets in here that clinicians are doing, but really what we find is that, uh, or what we have found, with the product's been in market for a year in one test market in this country, and now we're branching out. But what we found was that uh, we were able to bridge all of these obstacles that these patients or the clinicians were finding and at the same time start to engage the patients more um, with their own care, right? So if a patient's not involved in their care, they're less likely to have a healthy outcome. Uh, so it's a technology, as, uh, as, as they were talking about, the, you know, person-to-person -person technology, it just is a pathway for people to communicate differently, uh, but almost the same with one another. And that's a few minutes on that. Thank you, uh, My name is Brody Desmoni. I'm a chief technology strategist with Microsoft. I've been with Microsoft for 13 years, three of them down here. Um, and I'm a technology strategist focusing specifically in the healthcare space. Uh, my session today is a little bit different in that I'm taking some of the digital disruption that's going on in the industry today and trying to apply it in new ways in old industries to try to deliver better results. Um, so, Hello. Try that. There we go. So, um, the premise here is can digital disruption actually save lives? Um, and when I'm talking about digital disruption, most of you are well aware of what's going on with Uber and Airbnb and all the different types of uh, uh, new entrants that are coming out in the market. Um, and so what we're doing is we're taking what's going on in these spaces, and this is really the application of technologies, and in particular cloud-type computing to provide new ways of delivering services, primarily focused on end user experience, uh, delivering that I want a car in three minutes and I can get here and my phone's got the GPS and I've got a cloud and it's connected to the driver. All these things come together, but it's never been able to be done before. In the history of the earth, we haven't had all those technologies coming together at one point where that service could be delivered. But we've seen this starting to happen with what I consider to be traditional businesses as well. Uh, most of you are well familiar with UPS and the fact that they've kind of revolutionized the delivery of packages. 
but nobody had a personal experience with that. For the most part, it was just about them being able to track literally where your package is almost up to the minute. Uh, the moment it's been delivered, you guys have all had experiences where that thing comes up and tells you, alerts you immediately. And uh, UPS is actually starting to deliver some things called My Choice, which is actually taking that customer-centric experience so that the customer can have a more personal connection, believe it or not, with that package coming to the door and give them the ability to redirect it and do a bunch of other things. And it's about wrapping the consumer in, a, in an experience. But where I'm focused is on the other side, which is really the business-centric side of it. And I've used GE Healthcare kind of as an example of this. This is very much traditional business. But there's new ways to apply the same ideas and the same technologies to provide a new set of services. And so the one that I wanted to look at was one that I've been working on for the last year and a half, and it's one that I'm actually fairly passionate about. And the example that I'm going to use here is very specific to one type of one area, uh, which is cancer, which is something that's affected my family, and so it was one I got fairly uh, involved in. So take a traditional business today there is software out there that captures these medical images, and we're going to use mammograms as an example. And today, the way this is done is they're capturing and storing this in software, and it's stored at your local hospital. So you go in, you get a mammogram, it's stored there. And then a radiologist will take a look, and actually there's two radiologists that take a look at those images to determine whether or not you have cancer or whether they think you might have cancer. And then those results are sent on to an oncologist who will then report those results to you. That's traditionally how it's been done. It's been done that way for quite some time. The intervention of software just simply replaced a piece of film. But that's it. So my question to you is, how does digital disruption potentially affect this business? Anybody have some ideas? Come on, there's got to be some ideas out there. Yes, sir. You got it. That's the start of it. It's only the beginning. So when I started down this road, the first thing I wanted to do was try to solve the problem by simply just moving the images into the cloud. What, what, what would that effectively do? It was just a better way for them to back up. It was saving them costs on the local end. But once they ended up in the cloud, what could we do with them? Instead of just having the images from one hospital, I have the images from thousands of hospitals. We're talking millions of images. So I started doing some research, and guess what? Microsoft spends just over $10 billion a year on research and development. And you'd think it was around user design and interfaces and digital software, one form or another. Believe it or not, we have a research and development team just working on medical imaging analytics. So I started asking some interesting questions. You know, what could, what could we do if all the images were stored in one place? You know, what could we do if we could actually follow the treatments, and we have a healthcare company that I'm working with that actually not only does all of this medical imaging software, but they actually track all of the tests that happen and then actually can follow the patient all the way through to the actual treatment they've received and how did they finish off. Did the cancer, did they end up dying from cancer? Did it succeed? Are they cancer free? All those sorts of things. Also, what would it mean if we can identify these cancers in near real time? And potentially find the highest likelihood of survival. So the idea here is a couple fold. Number one, we're storing all the images in one place. We can now apply machine learning analytics to those images, be able to diagnose them in near real time, and instead of two radiologists, we could get down to one. That's going to save some cost. It's going to save some time. But not only that, but I could say there's 5,000 people in the US that have the same cancer you do. And of those, there were three different treatments given to those cancers. One of them might have been some sort of chemotherapy, another one had been surgery, et cetera, et cetera. And I can actually follow those statistically through to their outcomes. They had a survival rate of X percent. So the difference here is that we might be able to provide people a real-time diagnosis and the ability to show them of the three treatment options, statistically, this one has the, most, uh, the best likely outcome for you. So this is a whole new concept. It also introduces this whole idea of a new business model. Traditionally, you charge for software. It's package software package that you know, they put out into the market and they charge X number of thousands or millions of dollars in some cases. Um, this is actually turning the model on its head because we're now looking at a subscription and they're just simply charging by the number of images that are being taken. 
which from a healthcare industry standpoint makes a lot simpler because if you go in and get, they call this a, a, a research study done, um, the hospital gets charged by, or the, sorry, the hospital takes the image and they charge the insurance company and they pass a piece of that on to the software company that developed it. So it's completely changing the business model for this. So what I love about this is not only is it kind of delivering all the things we want, it's, it's actually increasing the market share for the company instead of just selling this traditional software package and they might have 40% of the market. This is completely revolutionizing how the software, the solution is being delivered. But it's also generating some new revenue channels for them. Not only are they able to subscribe uh, hospitals to this and simply receive money based on the number of images and the outcomes that are being done, but also the fact that they're now able to start providing that information in the form of research to um, uh, all these researchers out there that are studying cancer. Uh, we want to find the statistical outliers, like why did this particular woman survive this cancer when everyone else didn't? What was it? Was it environmental? Was it, was it something she was eating? Or was it another medication she might have been on? Statistically, what was causing this to happen? And if you can find those patterns, they could potentially find other treatments. So there's all sorts of different revenue um, channels for that. Not only that, of course, we're saving more lives and we're lowering the cost of health care. So what we're trying to do, and this is kind of the example in the case study I wanted to show here, was the fact that we're trying to use these digital disruption concepts that are being built out by the Airbnbs and the, the Ubers of the world, which are just trying to deliver a better customer experience. And we're trying to take those new concepts and try to figure out how we can save more lives and, and generate better outcomes from, for everybody, the companies and the people involved. So this is what I'm working on. Well, thank you very much. If you want to, to use the chair there. Sure. Uh, well, thank you very much for attention. Uh, thank you, Brody. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, thank you Wences. Uh, when we start building this panel, we, 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 we were trying to un identify what is the, the common path or the common ground they, they all have here. And it's simple. The, 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 the answer is very simple. They are changing traditional industries, traditional uh, uh, areas of knowledge with new digital journeys, with new interactions with the users, with new tools and protocols and, 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 and techniques to change the way that we are working. And w the most important thing that is happening today is, uh, I know Tom, I know Wences, and I know Brody, the, the industry they are working on now, right now is changing in the last two or three years. Two or three years ago, we were not talking about bitcoins, about digital imaging for, for healthcare, about tools to physicians to have all the information on their hands. And in the last two years, we were, uh, we were uh, part of this revolution that is changing the way that we do things every single day with Uber, with, uh, with uh, Amazon, with Apple, with all the companies that are changing the way that we work. And we are not aware of the things that are changing day by day. Martin told yesterday about the, 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 the technology voracious users that are consuming technology every single day and demanding more technology every single day. And these are three examples of how companies and people around the world are changing the way they, they are working. So this is a really interesting moment to, to, to raise questions and, and, and check how, the, how you can learn from, from these guys, how you, how you can tackle the design or the, or the experience design for, for any of the markets that we are, we are dealing with today. I don't know who wants to raise the first question. I'd have to say that it was originally, and uh, I think most organizations are coming to the realization that storing this data within their own data centers is actually traditionally was thought to be more secure. And uh, we're finding that public clouds, believe it or not, have more regulatory, more uh, certifications, um, and are better protected than most of the other private data centers. So we're finding that governments and others are finally starting to come to the idea that this stuff can be stored there. Don't get me wrong, there has to be layers of protection and 
when we're talking about just securing the data on top of that, we have to secure the fact that this person's mammogram doesn't get out with her information. It's, it's simply an image with some metadata associated, so it, it can't really be tied back to them. But these are, these are very serious issues, and we'd certainly take them seriously. And on the patient front, um, you know, the markets demand, if the markets demand certain things, regulations loosen up. And so patients are demanding more information and access to their care. So the traditional HIPAA certified rules that originally were written around Obamacare years ago are now starting to be rewritten to be more consumer friendly. Consumer friendly meaning the flow of information to the consumer is less restricted. Uh, and so you see work, you actually see people in hospitals using their own devices now, using secure apps like the one that we've developed. Uh, so there's a whole revolution that you know, from a business owner standpoint, it was awesome. And in Bitcoin, we are seeing, a, um, I think we are behind what the kind of phenomenon that they are describing in healthcare. Um, it's just beginning to happen in Bitcoin where you see different governments have a different sense of uh, understanding Bitcoin and regulating it in a way that can protect consumers, but at the same time, uh, allow it to happen. I think we're seeing that happen here in the US and Europe and a number of jurisdictions globally that are regulating in a way that makes it safer for consumers to use but allows it to flourish. Okay, question on, on your tool. Um, you see this as, as like a wedge Yeah, correct. I mean, the value of it begins to grow greater and greater the more that you can put the other bits together. And there's very few companies in the world that have access to all of it. It's still very fragmented in the industry. Uh, and so you're going to see a lot of collaboration. And there's organizations that have been created. Uh, one of them is called Commonwealth, which is a consortium of all the healthcare companies, EMRs, that allow them to communicate and pass uh, records back and forth on patients securely and with the patient's permission, of course. Um, so I think that's another part of this whole uh, solution that has to be still built out, is the ability for that information to be able to be shared in a way that's still secure, the patient's still in control of it. But I think you're gonna see a consolidation of companies that control that. Manage it, I should say, not control it, but manage it. What do you feel is gonna be the, the tipping point for Bitcoin adoption? You, in the example that you gave for cell phones, between landlines and cell phones, it was, not the actual device itself, it was really the, the introduction of a new uh, sales model, essentially, that for prepaid phones that kind of made it a runaway train. Um, what do you feel for Bitcoin? What do you, what do you think is gonna make it so that we eventually decide, hey, I don't want a transaction anymore in cash, I don't, I don't need my bank, I'm just gonna do deal with Bitcoin. So what, what do you feel is gonna drive us to that, and how soon? People in general are very impatient, and Silicon Valley in particular is most impatient, but in the last six years, Bitcoin went from zero, from going nowhere for the first two years, from January 2009, where it was launched, until December of 2010, it didn't go anywhere, it didn't have any users, any num material number of users, and it began to grow in January of 2011. Today has almost 15 million users, meaning 15 million people around the world own Bitcoin. Between 20 to 50,000 are buying their first Bitcoin every day. And if you do a copy-paste of the last five years, and apply it to the next five years without any new um, use case, any new glamorous catalyzer that Silicon Valley would love to see, just with some patience and some time, just five years, you have more users on PayPal than you have on, on Bitcoin that you have on PayPal. And then it be, just by network effects, it becomes, if, if, if there's uh, more people having Bitcoin accounts than there are PayPal accounts, it begins to be more useful as, as a payment mechanism. On top of that, there could be a number of positive surprises where it gets adopted for micropayments in the developed world or for people to spend digitally in the developing world. But I think that we don't need those. I think the most, the most likely path is a very boring path of a copy-paste of the last five years, and that's good enough. I wonder. Yeah. So just piggybacking on that question, do you see the possibility of people using Bitcoin or rather blockchain as a distributed security mechanism and payment kind of comes for free? 
So think about when you have billions of things and devices all around in public infrastructure and in homes and cars, and they all need distributed security because nobody wants that device to be hacked into. And blockchain could be that distributed security. And, and as part of that, uh, then you layer on Bitcoin on top of that, and then these devices are now able to pay for, for things or services to each other. Do you, do you see that as a possibility working out? Yeah, I think that's, that's definitely the case. And that's what's so attractive about the, 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 the Bitcoin technology, the blockchain that powers the Bitcoin, and, and vice versa to some degree too. Um, meaning that what Bitcoin makes possible that wasn't possible before Bitcoin is to have uh, a, a completely trustless public ledger that is permissionless. All of those things were not possible before, and it's now possible with Bitcoin, and you can see a lot of applications, some of them, like you will say, in security, but a lot of them in places where we now need a third party to verify something, where it's ownership of a certain thing, or that the transaction happened, or record keeping, and that we can now do without that a person in the middle, or, or institution in the middle. Okay, I have one question for Tom and maybe for Brody. In the applications you are building, or, or in particular in Tom, what's the, 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 the percentage of design uh, and coding for, for Rich? Because I saw that the design is very important, the three models and all this stuff is very important. What's the balance between coding, code, and all this stuff, and the, the proper design of the application? Um, again, because it's a business-to-business -business piece of software, uh, and we made a lot of mistakes in when we originally built it. it. It really is in design, designing around a workflow that is so ingrained in how people, all these nurses and PAs and doctors do business in a hospital, even in an, in, in an outpatient setting too. So design really took, um, really had to take the lead, uh, and the design lead had to come from our designers that's why I love the, the, the earlier conversation so much because it was all design driven against a workflow that would not accept disruption, mm -hmm. right? So you had to, you actually had to lie to the user and saying this isn't disruptive. This is absolutely a smooth part of your workflow, and it really was disruptive. But we had to mask it, like the zero design, the zero kind of like slickness of it, all had to be taken out so that they, the user, the end user, felt comfortable using it. So design led it, and then engineering, and it's a Unity platform, which allows us a, a tremendous amount of uh, ability to design and you know to develop what these designers had to create. So it was design-driven originally. Excellent. Well, uh, I think we have no more time. Uh, we can keep the conversation later on the, on the on the on the room. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you this excellent guys that help us to. Thank you.